When the world has got you down and Alzheimer's sucks. It's an equal opportunity disease that chips away at everything we hold dear. And to date, there's no cure. So until there is, we continue to fight with the most powerful tool in our arsenal, love. This is Love Conquers Alls, a real and really positive podcast that takes a deep dive into everything Alzheimer's, the good, the bad, and everything in between. And now, here are your hosts, Susie Singer-Carter and me, Don Priest. Hello, I'm Susie Singer-Carter. And I'm Don Priest, and this is Love Conquers Alls. Hello, Susan. Hi, Donald. I'm excited today. Are you? You're excited? Yeah. Are you excited about life or about the show? I'm excited about, well, life, because life is good. Yes. Because the alternative is not awesome. (laughs) That's true. That's true. (laughs) But... (laughs) We have some really special guests today I'm excited about. I'm suddenly feeling like, you know what I feel like? Smartless. Hmm. I feel like the Smartless. beginning of Smartless. You know the Smartless with Jason Bateman and, and oh. Sean Hayes and, yes, um, and, uh, and Will, Will Arnett? Arnett. Yeah, yeah, which is one of my other favorite podcasts, by the way. It yeah, doesn't talk out. about this top. Yeah, shout out to Smartless. Sure, I'll be a, Sure, we'll be... We'll be we'll be guests on your show. Why not? We'll be guests. We'll be guests whether you want us or not. We I would love guests. to be a guest on that show. But they, you know, they always have to like one of them books the guests and then yeah. they like brag about it and then sort of build it up and see yeah. if the other two can guess who the guests are going to be. So, so now I know why you're excited because you booked the guest today. I did book the guest today. Yeah. So, so do you okay. so so, okay, so let me just give you some hints, okay? Okay, okay. So, w- one of the guests that I know mm-hmm. is, uh, well, first of all, I really, really like this person, and I've known this person forever. Mm-hmm. And and um, I, I think what this person does is fantastic, and, and this mm-hmm. person has a great heart, and this person... Uh, is afraid of me, which is great. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's always the best. <laughs> uh-huh. So I'm the ruler. No. And yeah. then the other one, mm-hmm. you might know. You might know. I'm just saying you might, might know the other one. And, yes. and that person uh, just might be a fashionista and might have an obsession with color. Okay, that's it. That's it. Guess Okay, who? so these are all Guess the clues. Who? Uh, we could wait and have our audience kind of write in their guesses, but our show doesn't work that way. So no, it instead, doesn't. So just guess. Do you want me to guess? I'm guess. guessing that these are our favorite two guests of all time, Susie Singer Carter and Don, and Don Priest. Priest. That's right. Yeah. It's us. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That was a huge buildup for that. Today, I wanted to take the time because I think it's so important to talk about a project that Don and I are going to be producing or we are starting to produce right now, and that's No Country for Old People, which is a documentary based on my personal experience within the long-term care health system, which is going through horrific crisis and has been for decades. Um, but most of us don't know that until we're in it. And when we're in it, it's also overwhelming and also uh, complicated and for the most part, pretty much not what you expected, not person-centered, and in fact, almost the opposite. I was just going to say that. The experience has been so much the opposite of what you expected. Um, I I think everyone just has these kind of like, oh, this is the way it is, and this is what hospice is, and that's what all, and then we found out far from the, you know, far from the truth. Right. Listen, uh, I'm not throwing the net over every single facility. There are always exceptions and there's some lovely facilities that are well-meaning and are doing the best to navigate within the system that they have to. But they're still, even the greatest facilities are up against a very rigid sort of a system that doesn't, doesn't favor the residents or, or, or our loved ones. I didn't really know hospice. I didn't even know what, to be honest, what a bed sore was. I, you know, my, 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 vision of what a bed sore would be would be you know when you lay too long on one on one side of your body and and it's red and it's kind of sore i had no clue 
how severe they can get and that they can actually create the beginnings of a, of a ripple effect that leads to death. They're that severe and they're that dangerous. So, you know, these are things that we, sh we should know, we should be taught, but we don't know until we're in the situation and then there's so much going on that we can barely navigate all the facets of it and, and um, all the politics, insurance, and, and all the rules. There's so many rules that are protecting everybody but your loved one, unfortunately. And it's too much for us as caregivers on our own to really advocate because we're up against a really solid network, like a, like a hairball. It's just so, it's like a knot and it's been in place for so long. And that's what everyone's used to. This is the system. This is what we work in. Now let's make it work within that system. But what we need to do is burn the system down and start building it from scratch. Right? Yeah, because it, it's so flawed. It, it, well before COVID, you know, there was a problem and it was been there for, for a long, long time. And COVID has just opened up our eyes to say, oh my gosh, this is, this is, this is an epidemic. <laughs> this Let this me, is yeah. a pandemic. And, uh, and it's something that needs a vaccination and a booster. And <laughs> actually it needs more than that, but it needs help and it needs help now. I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read a little bit of, of uh, research just to set the stage on how the system works a little bit just to give you an idea. So most states, they, we have Medicaid, right? That, that is the payment system that reimburses nursing homes and they do this at a, at a relatively low level and the government doesn't hold these nursing homes accountable for what they're spending their dollars on. And that includes how they directly spend it on their residents' care. There's really no accountability in terms of where the money and how the money is spent. As long as the rules of Medicaid and the rules of government and the rules of the nursing home are checked off and no one's liable for anything, then everything's okay. So what happened, like what Don said, is like COVID-19 exposed the devastating consequences of staff shortages in nursing homes. And staff shortages are really the root of all of the evil. And staff shortages have been around for decades. It's just COVID really highlighted that when people were getting sick and there was nobody to replace those staff members, 75% of the nursing homes have had inadequate staffing before the pandemic even started. And what's worse is there's no national regulations, although California is one of the few states that has their own regulations, but that's not necessarily regulated the way it should be. The, the, the rules are not as stringent as they should be. So some of it feels a bit like a pacification because even the, the facility that my mom, which was a five-star facility that she was at, if you look them up, you'll see that their staffing quotas are, are well above the regulated amount that they're supposed to have. And yet I can, I'm here to tell you, it wasn't that at all. That was not my experience. There was often not a CNA or a nurse to be found on the floor and nurses were complaining and CNAs were complaining. And, you know, so there's the objective report and then there's the subjective report and that's me. There is a lot of money that's going into nursing homes, but the money is misappropriated. And the most expensive part of this business are the employees. So that's where they look to cut their costs. And on average, you have CNAs and, and nurses working between 17 to $21 a, an hour. And that's, that's for skilled nursing facilities. That's minimum wage. Well, it's, it's just above minimum wage. And I, I literally drove by a restaurant the other day in Simi Valley, and I saw a sign and it said dishwashers. And I'm not, you know, <laughs> disparaging dishwashers, but it said dishwasher wanted $20 an hour. So, right. you know, that puts it into some perspective that these are people who are taking care of our loved ones and possibly ourselves and uh and they're doing medical things <laughs> they're you know it's not that they're you know that's not that they're just mopping a floor or anything yeah it requires and, a lot of skills it requires people skills it requires empathy it requires intuition you know these are people everybody reacts differently these are not easy jobs these are hard jobs there's no incentive 
to want to work in this arena when you're getting paid so low. And that's why over 425,000 employees left the nursing home workforce since 2020. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and so, and, be, and who's replacing yeah. them, you know? <laughs> or, no, I mean, are people that aren't trained. Replaced? Yeah. Yeah. And if they are, you know, if they're being replaced, a lot of the, the, you know, the training is cursory. I, I was witness to that. The requirements are show up, you know, <laughs> unfortunately. And yeah. this is another statistic that's going to blow your mind is between one and a half to three, almost four million infections happen every year in long-term care facilities. And these are infections that can be avoided easily. And I'm talking about UTIs. I'm talking about bed wounds. I'm talking about sepsis and, and pneumonia. There's so much that could be avoided. And that's not even COVID. Right. And the bed wounds can be the root cause of all the things you just mentioned, the UTIs, the sepsis, the pneumonias. And you just have to make sure that they are not sitting in the same place or lying in the same place for too long. That's not a high skill. That's just care. That's just having enough people to make sure they're not. And it's so preventable. Once you see the very beginning of one, make sure it doesn't go any further. And that's not even being done. That And therefore, it gets to stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, and then eventually leading to all these things and to death in, many, in most cases with those once you get to a stage four wound. So for the first six months of this year, I watched as you fought this really hard battle with the nursing facility your mom was living at, and that sadly culminated in her passing on July 17th. Once someone has passed on, most people kind of want to move on because it's been so difficult and so hard, but you're motivated to create this documentary, and I was interested why you're so motivated and what led you to this point. So... You know, my mom had Alzheimer's for 16 years, just to just to backtrack a little bit. And, and you know, I learned a lot throughout this journey, and, and I didn't know anything about Alzheimer's in the very beginning. Who does, right? I learned by rote how to navigate and make the best out of the situation with someone who I love dearly and who was one of my best friends. And I was so happy because I, I was... I didn't want to put her in a facility, but when I found the facility that she eventually went into, I was, I felt relief like most of us do because, you know, you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. You can't keep them at home because A, you, you either can't afford it or their care is, is, is beyond what you can do in your own setting. So, which is both, both of those reasons were why I had to put my mom into a facility and finding this facility that she was in, I was thrilled and I, I talked about it on, on the podcast all the time, how I just felt a relief that I could sleep at night. My mom was taken care of. She was happy. She was thriving as best as she could with this disease and loved and, and that I didn't have to helicopter her. Because you did. You sung the praises of this place for so long. But when did you realize that something might actually be wrong with her care? I mean, you, yes, you know that. They're, but you think, well, they'll just replace them with somebody qualified. So when, when was that point? So COVID-19 exposed the devastating consequences of staff shortages. All we could do was Zoom. And so once a week, I was Zooming with my mom and my family. And about, I want to say the middle of the first year, I, and my mother was in a wheelchair, but she wasn't bedridden at all and, very, and, and still as social as she could be with the stage of Alzheimer's that she was at, right? And every Wednesday at three o'clock, I would start noticing my mom was in bed at three in the afternoon, not dressed. And I'd ask the CNA who was facilitating the Zoom, you know, why, why is my mom in bed? Is she okay? Oh, I don't know, Susie. She's, I, I, let me find, I'll ask the nurse and get back to you, right? So week after week, I kept, and I also would email and say, you know, hey, is there anything wrong? My mom has been in bed the last few times. I'm just trying to figure out what's going on. And I eventually got a couple calls from the social worker who I knew very well, who said she wasn't sure why my mom was in bed, but her guess was that maybe she was um, having a sore 
or something that they were trying to keep her off of the chair, but no one had alerted me of that. So and they're supposed uh, to by by they're yeah. by law they're supposed to if they have a bed sore they're supposed to tell you correct? Pretty yes yes so you know but I still and and also you know I I trusted them so I was thinking well you want everything to be good because your hands are tied so you keep mm -hmm. you make excuses in your mind and you think oh that makes sense but why is she in her pajamas at three in the afternoon right like mm -hmm. it looks like she hasn't even been her hair hasn't been brushed and she just doesn't look right and and it's a boat you never had to rock before so right it's it's like it, it you don't know what's going on at the point so you kind of have to you're getting gathering information as it's going right and that's hard right. to do too over zoom so yeah and then i was told a couple of times she was she was tired and they were just resting before dinner and i thought okay and you want to believe that then there came this the, the last the last zoom i had had with her in january was like I, I I really felt like she was, I, I don't know how I could tell, but she looked dehydrated. She didn't, she wasn't responding the way she normally did. You actually came with me on that weekend to see her. We were able to visit with her outside. She did look dehydrated to me. She looked unkempt and not bathed. And uh, we ultimately found that she had someone else's bridge in her mouth that you discovered. Yeah, because she she did she didn't wear bridges anymore, you know, mm -hmm. for a long time and suddenly I go, what's that in her mouth and flopping around. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, and it was um sorry for yeah. the grossness, but But it, you know it, it is somebody else's. <laughs> yeah, and they were not clean. That pretty much ended our visit. <laughs> I I rolled her back into the lobby. And I said, you know, I think my mom's got someone else's bridge in her mouth. Oh, that's impossible. I said, well, I, they're not hers. And the charge nurse came over to look and so she was mortified and took them out of my mom's mouth and said, it must be the temp nurse because everything is marked here. And yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. And uh, da, 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 da. And I said, well, yeah, I'm a little concerned because COVID and she also doesn't look clean and she looks dehydrated can you guys give her some attention <laughs> so that was that and then less than 36 hours later my mom landed in the hospital and I was called by the hospital and told she was being admitted with a, a, a level four a bed yeah. sore on her back along with sepsis and a UTI and pneumonia and 10% kidney functioning and that was the beginning of the end that was the start of the six months I was talking about, you know, yeah. that you just went through. So it ended up that my mom was in and out of the hospital five times in six months. And the reason why this occurred was that the accepted long-term protocol that's in place was not working for my mom. It, you know, it becomes checks and balances, which is guided by Medicaid and Medicare and what they will cover and what they won't cover. And when somebody becomes too time consuming, they want to push that resident into hospice and move them along quicker than they should be moved along, right? So what happened was the, the lack of care that was given to my mom took an egregious toll on her physical health and it also accelerated her cognitive decline and the stage four pressure wound was being ignored and that continued to create that ripple effect that I spoke of before, continued to bounce her in and out of the hospital. And as she became more labor intensive and with the lack of staff that they had, she was not having her wound taken care of and, and that wound continued to exasperate all the other vulnerabilities that, that come along with that. UTIs and, and sepsis and pneumonia. Despite my relentless advocating, my mom died essentially from a bed that wound. Was not, not, and that wasn't even revealed to and, you that, we, that you never knew about. And the truth is, is that the actual definition for neglect is any bed sore that's past a level two. Because anybody can get a sore. That happens, you know, when you're bedridden. Yeah. Or if you're sitting in a chair too long, that can happen. But that's what one of the main jobs is at a long-term nursing home. Most people are confined to chairs. I didn't see a lot of people walking around 
in long-term care. Most people are in wheelchairs. And as you've said, you saw over the Zoom, so she's just, why is she in bed in the middle of the day? Right. Why, why, why? Yeah, it's so... Right, right, right. It's... I mean, I found myself, I was basically in the front lines of this catastrophe for six months. It was a systemic army that I was up against, you know, that mm -hmm. I didn't even know I was up against. And, and so it didn't matter how much I advocated and, and that I was there every day, which I never was there every day before. But I, I felt compelled to have to, to have to be there because if I wasn't, something awful was happening and it still was, even though I was there, like you, you coined it as whack-a-mole and that's exactly what it felt like. Well, because yeah, I mean, sometimes I would go with you, but most often you would be going by yourself. And so after you would, it would like literally every day, it wasn't that the, you know, the same thing was happening every day. Every day there was something different, something new that was fully preventable. And, and so you were, you were constantly trying to navigate things you didn't know. You, every day you, you came across something you didn't know was happening, what was supposed to be happening, right. what to even ask for. <laughs> what what to even say? What? How do we address this? And the truth is, is that once she went into the hospital because of the wound, her extreme case of pneumonia caused her to have to be intubated. That caused them to have to give her a G tube, which was supposed to be temporary, which is feeding her through the stomach. Uh, and a Foley they told catheter me, and, and the yeah, Foley yeah. catheter. But and then when she was finally released from the hospital, and I said, those. The Foley catheter and the G tube need to be removed now. My mom was, you know, urinating before, fine, and eating is her life, right? <laughs> like well, she needs to get back to to eating through the mouth. I mean, those are the joys. That's quality, you know. Without that, what do you have? And what they else is there, yeah, right. And point. they refused to to take it out, saying that it was too much of a risk and and that the Foley catheter was completely healthy. And and you know, as it turned out, it wasn't. My mom ended up back in the hospital because of the Foley catheter causing her to hemorrhage. My mom was suffering so bad because she wanted to eat orally, and they refused to do that. And why did they refuse to do that? Because there wasn't enough staff, and this was an easy way to make her less work. And, yeah. and then there's a point in the system where they push their residents into hospice before they're ready to go because... In hospice, and these are things I learned along the way. Medicare and Medicaid don't cover certain things. It's really a you know a waiting out period for someone to pass away, and so they push the morphine and, and tell you that everything's going to be okay or whatever ailments your mom has, whether it's a UTI, whether it's pneumonia, whether it's the wound. Just give her morphine and she'll be okay. She won't feel it. Well, no, she wasn't ready. She was still at the baseline that she was before she went into the hospital. They just decided they didn't want to deal with the repercussions of what had happened in the hospital to get her back mm -hmm. to where she was. You're so tired and you're so emotional and you're so overwhelmed as the caregiver. You're looking for answers. And even if you know in your gut that what they're telling you is wrong, you're up against this wall of, of people that are trained to come back at you with those answers. Yeah. You're stressed out. You're not, you're not, you're not seeing the reality. Your mother's dying. Well, yeah, she's dying, but she's not ready to die now, which is proof, proof by the fact that she lasted for six more months when they told me she needed to be in hospice. Well, they told you she had one hour, two hours to live. Right. Know, six months earlier and six yeah. months later, she was still. And, and also, and, and going back to what you just said, they, you know, that it's you, you know, you're the problem, basically. You and, and then yet they want you to make the decisions. You know, right. it's, it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you're too stressed. You're too stressed out. You don't understand. What do you want us to do? Right, right. Like the calls I got <laughs> at like two in the morning. Your mom is hemorrhaging. What do you want us to do? Wants what do you mean? Do what do right. I want you to do? I want you to take care of her. Can you take care of her there? No. Well, then you need to call 911. Oh, okay. is that what you want us to do? <laughs> okay. Th that's what you, you know, want us to do. So, you know, and, all, yeah. most of the decisions are made on, you know, mitigating their liability and and making sure that you know they are they are doing everything by the book and not for the good of the of the patient or the resident and so 
based on the, the quote-unquote norm. Well, guess what? With human beings, there is no norm. Everyone's different. It's a rhetoric of this is what's best for them. This is comfort. We just want to keep your mom comfortable. Well, not giving her liquids is not comfortable. That is, that's no, and, the and, op- and, being, and being intubated three times is right, not comfortable. Right, is not comfortable. <laughs> that's, that and doesn't having, sound like, yeah. And having a G-tube, folks, is not comfortable. G-tubes are for people that are normally in a coma or had a stroke. And it's the last thing you want to do because if someone still has the will to eat and the will to drink, you need to respect that and allow them. That, be, that is their quality of life. Like we spoke about with, with, um, with the speech therapist, Adria Thompson. Would speech therapists have to assess whether someone can swallow or not? It's a huge decision that you don't make lightly, right? Well, and you showed them she could swallow. Right. You were able to give her, finally, after fighting and fighting and fighting, they wouldn't give her any liquids, anything, you, they, right. and they told you you couldn't. Well, when you showed them that she could swallow, they still said, well, only you can do it. Our staff is not going to do that because they, she could aspirate. It's all a liability, but they're not worried about the liability of all the other things, all the other repercussions of the, of the care or non-care that was going on. And so there's the, there's the conundrum right there, uh, right. and that's what right. and that's what you have, that's why you are heading in this direction with doing this documentary to point well, out yeah. this I mean, is I the want, problem. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I want to tell. I need to tell. I've seen things that I can't unsee, and I have to tell a com- entirely different story than my mom and the girl even though this is inspired by my mom, this one is a cautionary tale. And this is a, a call to action. And I, I, I feel compelled to expose like this facade of, of what looks to be safe and comfortable and patient-centered that, that this long-term care system has been successfully propagating for decades. And, and to the point where we all want our... Most of us, you know, let me rephrase that. Most of us care whether our our loved ones are being cared for. And when we're told that they're being cared for, we want to believe it. Why wouldn't we, right? And we so, want to trust. We want we to want trust, trust na- yeah. naturally. We want to trust. And we want to trust in the people who have taken this on as their responsibility, who have gone into this business, mm-hmm. and it is a business, to care for our elderly and are sick, and yet they don't want to do the things it takes. <laughs> to, well, they can't. <laughs> they can't. They can't. Because the funds aren't there, the people aren't there, but yet they're still, the facade is still there. Right. But the, and the funds are there. They're just being misappropriated. misappropriated because that, yeah. yeah. Back to what you said, it's a business, and this whole facade is propagated by these businesses that subscribe to the notion that honesty is far less profitable than dishonesty. And they really do regard humans as commodities. I mean, that's what they are, essentially. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and I'm not a negative person. That's, and I, this is what's, what I want to relay in this documentary is that I, I, so, I so had faith that my mom was in the best facility and in the best place. And really believed that, you know, but the truth is, is that it's deceitful marketing that works on most of us like it did me. Right. And, and I had no idea. Yeah. Yeah, I had no (laughs) idea. Some people choose to, and some people will, will just ignore it. And you know, it is what it is, whatever they say it is, but you got confirmation from people, from staff members that what you, you were not imagining this. No. I mean, I had staff members say to me, we're drowning and we've lost all our good ones. There was a few, there was maybe one or two that were uh, nurses and CNAs that were there before COVID, you know, and then when we had our, our guest Rick Montcastle on the show, who was the subject of the, of the Hulu miniseries Dope Sick, he had led this investigation on nursing home fraud. And he started to validate my fears, which was that you know, when they were boots on the ground and they were investigating these nursing homes that were five-star nursing homes 
all across the country. They'd find residents every time in a chair, sitting in their urine or their feces for hours on end. And he said, you know, that neglect had regrettably become the industry's standard. And that's, yeah. that's just a fact. It doesn't matter what the rating is, how much you pay. The business model depends on understaffing. It just does. By the way, these places are not inexpensive. No. <laughs> uh, they are very expensive. And so what, you know, the unfortunate thing is, well, if, you know, they'll say, well, you know, if we put more staff on, we're going to have to charge you more. It's not about coming out of their pockets. It's going to come out of the, the pockets of the people who are going to be there to a point where no one, no one's going to be able to afford these places. We're lucky we have Rick Montcastle as, as a producer with us who's so supportive of, of getting this message out. And then we're working with, with organizations like the National Consumers Voice, who's been around since 1975, and they've been fighting against nursing home neglect, and they are powerful and they're pure-hearted, and they have research and they have all of you know they have substantiated what what is actually happening we also are working with with canner which is a an organization here in in california that also protect the rights of residents in nursing homes we really need to, to unfortunately we need to burn the system down and start over we need to start from scratch and we have to because my mom's just one of millions of people who are suffering like right now every day because of nursing home neglect and abuse. And this is not just my story. This is your story. This is all of our story because God willing, we all get older and we all will be a carer or a carry, right? Like you said, you've ag aggregated some amazing experts on the subject, but you've also heard from so many people who have experienced something similar something, you know, I mean, uh, some of the truly shocking stories Yes. who will be part of this documentary. Yes. The, and I think people sometimes don't think they have a voice. Well, you're providing a voice, you know, through this. Um, and, and again, anyone who's listening to this, if you have uh, stories or, or know of anything that that's related to this, we want to hear from you. Definitely. Um, because it's it's so important that you know this this documentary will be told through the story of, of of Norma, but it it just that's the vehicle. But we want we need people to get on top of that vehicle and ride with well, us. We have on this. yeah, I mean we have <laughs> testimonials from nurses and CNAs and doctors and specialists, people from Medicare and Medicaid and elder abuse lawyers and people that will pull the curtain back on all these veiled practices. There's practices like the death panel. There's you know on the opposite end. There, there's also when people are not in hospice and they're and they're being given ultra high care, needless, needless, you know, like Expensive therapies, care. Yeah, yeah, so that they can so that they can make money off of them, and it's actually yeah. making that person frailer than they are, making it stronger. So these are other practices that go on in the opposite direction. There's early hospice, and there's even euthanasia, and. That's that's, yeah. that's a whole nother story. So, you know, it's a it's really a, a much needed punch to the gut yeah. to look at our yeah. health care system that's literally and collapsing. To be clear, yeah, and to be clear, there's so many people who are in this system who are not in control of it. They are there. They are true angels right. that are that are that are part of the system unwittingly because and and they you know i feel i feel for them because well, that's why we, they're all, we heard from them we've yes, heard from and, them and they're and they're they're in pain over this oh my god that's why a lot of them are leaving this this industry because they can't stand witness to this i had a nurse tell me the week my mom was dying and she said don't bring her back here and um was extraordinary because she could somehow compartmentalize and still be, mm -hmm. still have a heart. So, you know, it's not easy. It's not easy. And um, so anyway, that's what we're doing. I hope to make some impact and move the needle and hopefully help other people avoid this horrible chapter that I went through that is so stressful and so on so many levels. You're already losing someone you love and then to have all this other unnecessary stress is is it's 
it's uncalled for and it's egregious and and I don't want anybody else's loved one to suffer physically like my mother did for reasons that could have been avoided. And for the caregiver to suffer. I mean, for six months, you went every day you to a point where you had to move from your home into another place that was closer because the commute was so bad. And the stress level on the caregiver is is unmeasurable. And, and that's why, you know, I think some people are going, Susie, how can you keep going with this? It's, it's over. Well, no, it's not over. And your mom shouldn't have gone through this, and you should not have gone through this in vain. Right. And so, so uh, through you and, and the, the, the team you've, you've created, and your mom, because <laughs> she's still there, she's still pushing, <laughs> she's, she's right behind you every day, you know, there, this will not be in vain. There will be change. No country for old people. Let's make it a country for old people. Let's let's revere them. Let's change that. Stay tuned. We're going to um, keep you updated on it. And we've got some great other guests coming up next week um, that I'm excited about. Yeah, absolutely. And as we said, if you have stories, if you know anyone who would like to support this or be a part of it, we'd love to hear from you. And, uh, and we really until would. Yeah. next time. Yeah. So because why? Uh, because you know what, Don? I love my I, mom I do so know much. What. You do love your I mom. Do, I loved my mom, <laughs> and I still love my mom. And really, you know, it's what it's all about. It is. Isn't you it? know why? You why? know why? why? Because love is powerful. Love is contagious, and love conquers alls. Please uh, share, like, do all those things, subscribe, and uh, we'll definitely see you next time. Take care of yourself, stay safe, and kiss all the people you love. Bye. Bye. <laughs>